Intro. <laughs> yeah, this is a new intro I worked on last night. Um, he plays Diana with it. Let me, let us know if you like it or not. It's new. So good data morning. <laughs> Have a good data day, everybody. Yes, our new swag. I hope you do enjoy it. Today we have a very special guest and friend, and I think you're going to learn a lot from his story, and you'll see why you should consider a career in data analytics that's serving the higher education. So if you're considering one, or if you're just embarking on your data analytics journey, or if you're looking at making a switch, you should listen in and see why you should. Our guest today has over 15 years experience in higher education, specifically in program development, strategic and financial planning, and analytics and reporting. He helps academic institutions leverage their data to make decisions so they can truly focus on improving the institution rather than sorting numbers on a page. Well said. He currently serves in the advisory board of the Certificate of Business Analysis and Decision Making at Simon Fraser University. He is a Tableau Desktop Qualified Associate and he brings out the best in the people that he works with by being the leader, mentor, a teammate in the true meaning of these words. Everyone, please welcome Andrew Drinkwater. Hey, Andrew. Good morning. Good Andrew. morning, everybody. <laughs> Fellow Vancouverite. How are you this morning? I'm doing very well. It's, it's Friday. It's pretending to be sunny. And we got lots of data problems to solve, so I'm pretty happy to be on the Good Data Morning Show. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thanks for, for being much on. For being here. So let's dive into it. Why education and why do you think working with education data is fascinating? Okay, yeah, start with the, uh, start with the big questions. <laughs> so I think for me, the reason why I wanted to call this Careers with Meaning and why I wanted to talk about working with education data is that there is there's a level of intrinsic motivation that you can get by working in an industry like education and i imagine this is true of others like healthcare as well but essentially you are serving a public good so you're helping people build their future build their dreams and learn new things and so your efforts contribute to having a better society all around you i think this is a pretty cool way to make your mark on the world and it's part of why i chose to to work in education so for me it's about helping helping others but in a way where they can really catapult to their next level and i don't know very many other industries where that kind of feeling is really really yeah. true that's that's well said and uh yeah i would imagine it really gives you a sense of purpose every day you're working on these types of projects and serving that higher education sector. And I'm, I'm really curious um, if, if you, we can talk about any of those projects or give us a highlight on some of the things that you guys have done, or if there's a particular project that was really dear to your heart. Yeah, so, so there's been a few, as it turns out. Uh, so by way of background, Plaid Analytics provides data data and analytics solutions, business process improvement, and training and workshops. And we work almost exclusively with the education industry. Mm -hmm. uh, most of our clients are in higher education. So institutions like the University of British Columbia or British Columbia Institute of Technology, Queen's University, and a number of others as well. Um, and we started uh, almost five years ago now. It's it's creeping up pretty quick on that big anniversary. So we're going to have to have some digital balloons uh, or something <laughs> pretty soon. <laughs> uh, but in terms of projects that I've been personally really proud of is projects that lead to either my clients in the case of being a consultant or um, my coworkers when I worked inside the walls of the institution. Um, projects that helped illuminate something that either they didn't expect or that they did expect, but they'd never been able to prove. And so analytics to me is a good way of bringing out that possibility for people. Now, many people that work in education, and this is true of other industries as well, they're ex 
first experiences with analytics are often that somebody in their organization sent them a spreadsheet and they were kind of excited to begin working with data. And then they opened the spreadsheet and they got maybe 200 columns and 400,000 rows of data. And they looked at it and they went, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> this isn't what I thought. I would do to make a decision with data. I was expecting some insight to help me make a better decision. And this is, oh, this is not what I signed up for. And so projects that help shift from that feeling to, oh, this is really cool. I didn't expect that. Or this confirms a suspicion I've had for a long time really helps. So e examples of that kind of project, um, we're currently working with an institution to help them better understand uh, their compliance with provincial student aid eligibility. So the rules differ by province in Canada and state in the US, but the basic idea is that in order to be eligible for student aid, you have to offer certain kinds of courses within a certain period of time. So let's say for a bachelor's degree, it's considered to be a four year program. And within that time, it has to be possible for students to take the required courses. Mm -hmm. Now they can take longer if they so choose, but it has to be possible for them to finish in four years, technically speaking. Um, and so what we do with a project like that one is we try and understand what are the what are the program requirements? And then we look back into the history of course offerings and what are planned coming up and say, how realistic was this? Like if a student started in fall of 2018, would it have been possible for them to finish their program or as far as long as they could be by 2021? Uh, or was it not? In which case the institution might have some additional work to do. Uh, so that's that's a one that's ongoing that I'm really enjoying because it's harder to surface that information than you would like to think uh, from these information systems. It's It's complicated. Right. But sorry, go on. Yeah, so I think uh, another one that I really enjoy, I'm gonna harken back to my experience working for Simon Fraser University, and it, it's true in consulting as well. Uh, when I'm teaching something like Tableau to a user who has either a little bit of experience or never worked with data before, and they're able to put together their first dashboard, and they're able to derive insight from that so they can make a better decision or they can go to their next committee meeting and say, hey, look what, look what I uncovered. It turns out that the reasons that our number of admits are down this week is because we've fallen a week and a half behind processing timelines in terms of like getting back when we had paper applications, getting paper applications through the system. But even in the digital era, there's manual review on lots of things because it doesn't work quite perfectly. And so making it possible for somebody to bring that insight to a group and say like, what we really need to do is put a bit more effort into processing to catch up. And then odds are pretty good, we're gonna meet our goals. But if we don't do that, we're gonna lose these students. Uh, so helping people find insights like that with their data, to me, that's that's really enjoyable. And that's part of why I chose to work here. It's beautiful. Just want to say hello to our audience to to start. Hi, Collins from from Kenya and uh, Omiana and uh, Dabo Manjunata. It's very nice to for you to tune in and Susan and Tom. And there's a lot of other people joining us. So thanks so much for for joining us in. And Ayush, so nice to see you every time on the Good Data Morning Show. And Greg loved the intro, apparently. So uh, maybe we'll reuse it again. <laughs> so Andrew, I'm curious. Uh, so talking about these projects, I'm, I'm curious now with, with the pandemic, things changing. Are there any areas within the higher education that have emerged as priorities recently? Mm, that's a really good question. So I think the one that's most obvious through the pandemic has been planning around a safe return to campus for students. And this depends a little bit on the institution and a little bit on the geographic locale that they're in. So from my vantage point, and I'm based in Vancouver, Canada, which I think you guys mentioned, it seems to me that uh, a lot of the Canadian institutions are planning for how do we return students safely to campus once the vaccination programs are at a reasonable level that it's possible to have these kinds of plans. Now, that may that sounds a little bit future focused, but we're seeing this as being like next fall. So it's actually coming pretty quick. Some institutions, particularly those that offer certain kinds of healthcare disciplines, are still running classes in person, but they have to rethink substantially how they do it uh, in order to keep students apart and um, and in rooms that are appropriately uh, have appropriate HVAC systems and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a huge amount of planning that's gone into this. 
Um, what I'm seeing more out of the institutions that are in the United States is that they're responsible more directly for um, measuring, you know, COVID test results and making sure that their campus stays below a certain threshold. I'm seeing a little bit less of that in Canada, and I think it's a difference in how the health authorities are set up for it. Um, but all the institutions around the world right now are doing a huge amount of planning in ways that they hadn't before. And what they're discovering is that some of the systems they had in place are too rigid for this kind of planning, right? It, it's like what Nicholas, um, T Nicholas Nassim Taylor wrote about in the Black Swan is like, well, we could have predicted that there might be a pandemic one day. It was really hard to predict that this pandemic would happen in this way. And so it's known as a Black Swan event. It's really hard to plan for this for your organization. So for many, even though they'd done significant risk planning, it was a real surprise to figure out how to actually plan for this kind of a scenario. And so lots of people uh, really rose to the occasion, uh, whether they worked inside the walls or whether they were like us outside the walls trying to help and say, let's figure this out together. Let's get your systems up and running so that you can do this kind of planning. Because unlike in previous years where you could rely, rely on your history, now you have to figure it out on the fly and everything is different. So you have to be mm -hmm. able to grapple with that. Um, and so those are the biggest changes I've really seen happening. Mm -hmm. I think the other general one that's true of all industries is, is like everybody's working from home. We're all adapting to a new way of connecting with each other with pros and cons, right? The Zoom social hour is not quite the same as when you got together with your friends after work, yeah. but it helps a little bit, right? So those kind of changes are also happening and it's causing a lot of modernization in terms of how these institutions are working with themselves and with people outside like us. What about uh, some data analytics projects? Do you think, you know, next year or even this year, there'll be some analysis on the last year performance of students, for example, in comparison to the previous years or to see that if this remote uh, learning has had any effect on their studies or on picking up mm -hmm. new um, you know, new knowledge, whatever that might be. Yeah, so I think it's already happening is the short answer. So we're either hearing about or directly seeing institutions that are now at the point where they can look back because it's been almost a year since everything started shutting down. They can now look back and say, you know, what was the impact? Now, call it last winter or spring term between about January and April. You know, there was a sudden stop and most institutions gave their instructors between one and two weeks to figure out how to turn their in-person course into online. Yeah. And research has shown that apparently two thirds of faculty members had never taught anything online up until that point. And so they really stepped up to figure out how to do this, but it was a rush and everybody knows it. So the, the spring and winter term was probably a little bit weird. The summer they had a little bit more time to prepare and the fall they had arguably at least, a reasonable amount of time to prepare. So we're not really comparing pre-COVID and post-COVID, but within each of those terms, what happened, right? So what we're seeing examples of is many institutions had effectively a, it, there were different implementations of it, but the gist of it was you could opt for essentially a pass-fail type grade rather than a letter grade in certain kinds of courses. Hmm. Um, that was a pretty common move to deal with the fact that, you know, people were working from home and exams were different and so on. Uh, the other tactic that was pretty common was to push out ad drop deadlines to be more in favor of the student. And so rather than having a, a course drop deadline in say week four or five of a 13 week semester, maybe it was week eight or 10, um, to give students time to get feedback from their instructors to know whether this was the right course for them. So it's hard to compare apples to apples when you talk about, say, this fall versus the previous fall. Um, but we are seeing institutions trying to look at and understand what was the impact of those kind of policy changes. And is there anything they could learn from it that would be helpful going forward? Um, we're certainly hearing from a lot of institutions that they think there's been some positives from the shift to online learning. And they know there's been lots of negatives too. So they want to find the best positives and be able to leverage those going forward. And then, you know, as it's safe to go back to in-person, you don't have to put up with the negatives of the online, but there, there's pros and cons to both. And they're trying to identify those through research now. I, th I think we'll learn a lot from that. I know my own experience as a student, my university offered classes essentially in alternating formats. So one week we'd be online, one week we'd be face-to-face. -face. And for me as a student, that was exceptional because believe it or not, I was shy. And I didn't speak up in class, but when I was in the online forum, I found my voice. And that is a big reason why I'm here today. So I hope we learn something from this pandemic that will benefit students. 
and uh, Nishiza is uh, working with the University of Calgary with students' data. So I concur with a lot of what, what Andrew is saying. Nice oh, to thanks see you, so much. Uh, I think there is a great question from um, Majunata, if you if you can find it, George. Yes. Uh, what are some of the note noteworthy real time analytics wins in higher education? Please share. Thank you. That's a really good question. So one of the, I think there's a lot of them, but we also are fairly compressed for time. So I won't spend the rest of my time together talking about that. But some of the real time analytics wins to me are efforts that can help reduce the data silos. And so this is true of most industries where one department has their own data, another department has their own data, and they don't talk to each other particularly well. And this is definitely true in higher education. And so ways of bridging some of those gaps can be really helpful. So some of the things I see growing right now are data governance. Um, no surprise to people that are watching this show. Um, many, yeah, <laughs> many institutions across North America are embarking on this in a major, major way. And this appears to be true across the world as well. Um, and data governance can help to break down some of those silos because rather than essentially using the silo as the gatekeeper for who gets access to what, you use a set of processes and rules that determine who should get access to what and when, and in particular why, which isn't always documented in the silo approach. Uh, there's a whole bunch more about data governance, which of course you could check out on George's website. He knows much more than I, but this is one area that I see as, as growing. Mm -hmm. um, another way to break down the silos is to, uh, to intentionally adopt technology that allows you to do that. So an example of this is we ran a webinar earlier this week, actually, that's on our website, which will be shared at some point later, um, focused on the logical data fabric. And so our focus for this was institutional research, but the basic idea of the logical data fabric is that we create these virtual layers that are between your source data system and the end user, such as an analyst, who actually needs that data. And so rather than, <laughs> yeah, that side, uh, rather than having to remember to connect to these 14 different systems, some of which are in the cloud and some of which are on campus and many of which have different VPNs to get to them, this virtual data layer in between takes care of all of the heavy lifting. Um, and so we partner up with a company called Denodo to do this, but there's others that also are in this space. It's a really neat way of allowing your analysts and other stakeholders as relevant to get to insight faster because they're not spending their time fiddling with getting access. This allows you to have better security too because you can say, okay, well, George works in alumni engagement and so he should only have access to these types of data and we should actually mask certain identifying things like maybe social insurance number uh, as one of the columns in our database because George has no need to know that information. And so virtualization technology is a really interesting way to break down some of those silos while actually making them more secure and reducing your need to replicate your data across different places because the virtualization layer takes care of all of that for you, uh, meaning you don't need replication in the same way that you do with, say, a data lake or data warehouse or something like that. Uh, so that, to me, holds some really interesting promise. And then I think the third thing I'd say, and this relates a little bit to breaking down silos, but it's more people-based. Uh, the third one is getting people to talk to one another. I, I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but it's hard when we're all working in the same building and it's way harder now that we're working all across the globe potentially and trying to keep in touch with each other. So for me, one of the most interesting experiences working with people who aspire to be better at analytics is what's called paired analysis. And this, this research was done by, by somebody I went to grad school with years ago, but the basic idea is you, you pair a tool expert like me with a subject matter expert uh, like Diana, and we work together to solve a problem. And we actually both learn more as a consequence because I better understand the context of the data and then you get a chance to learn the tool from somebody who spent years doing it. So those are the three things I think are really important. Great Thank question. you, Andrew. Quite a comprehensive answer as, as usual. Uh, so you did bring up the, the webinar, so I want to draw attention to it one more time. So just go to uh, plaid.is right here. You'll end up on their page, and on the right, top right, you'll see the webinars. You'll see the upcoming one on next Tuesday. 
So you can just register, attend it for free, but you can also see it on demand along with other previous uh, great webinars that you could uh, just see at your own time and pace. So uh, Andrew's team is always uh, putting great resources here. So please do check it out. And um, they do have a newsletter that you can sign up for free as well. So um, that, that should pop up the you know the moment you're you're coming on the site so uh do uh do consider that one as well yeah we uh -huh. hope some people can join us for that workshop on tuesday this is going to be pretty cool you'll get your own virtual machine you'll be able to connect to the denoto platform try out building some views and check out the data catalog for those interested in data governance it'll be a lot of fun so uh, if you can sign up link is there and the previous webinar is is recorded Sorry, Deanna, I cut you off. Yes. Well, I was wondering if someone is at the beginning of their career, right? So they're either a mm. student or they're just starting and they're looking into um, going into um, education and education analytics. I have two questions here. So first, how would you make them excited? So maybe you can give us a few examples of your biggest achievements or the things that you, you know, when you think about the past, your past work, things that stand out that you've managed to achieve through data to through education analytics. And then the second one, what would be the steps that you would suggest to them? So for the first question about something that I'm really proud of, I'm going to go back to actually the very early years of, of my career. So I started as a student advisor and recruiter for a program that's called Interactive Arts and Technology at Simon Fraser University. Um, and one of the peculiar things that happened in that time is we grew really fast. It was probably market-based, but it sure looked good on my resume at the time to say we grew threefold in four years. Um, it turns out though, that when you work for the government, growing threefold in a very short period of time is not the wisest strategy. And the reason for that is your funding isn't based on that growth like it is in the private sector. Your funding is based on whatever budget was set as part of the planning process. So suddenly we had all these students and not enough people to teach them and we couldn't afford to hire more people to teach them. So this problem is how I ended up in analytics in the first place. Lots of people think I became an entrepreneur because of business school, which really was the push that I needed to get into it. But my work at Interactive Arts and Technology was actually the thing that got me thinking creatively about how to solve problems in the world. And it was probably the reason why I went to business school later and became an entrepreneur. Um, so for me, trying, trying to solve that problem by just intuiting what should happen was impossible. There were too many students and not enough resources to be able to service them. Mm -hmm. So what we were able to do by bringing data into the equation is to say, okay, where are our students in the system, right? It, it, the analogy is it's a little bit like a snake eating some kind of food, animal of some variety. <laughs> and the, the animal moves through the snake, essentially planning for academic programs is not that different. So if you have a huge bulge of students that come in in one year, they're going to be with you for like four years. You have to plan for this. And then they're going to graduate and then your numbers will drop unless you kept your growth that high. And so it's a bit of a different planning model because it has a long tail to it. Um, and so bringing data into that meant we could figure out, okay, well, how many people probably need first year courses now and are going to need second year courses next year? We can plan our teaching capacity much better once we had that data. So more than anything else, that project, if you will, was the starting point of my analytics career. So I'm really proud of that. And I'm pleased to say that interactive arts and technology is thriving these days. Uh, we, we grew too fast, but we figured out how to deal Amazing. with it. Uh, yeah, and they're making a huge mark in the world. So that's really cool. Uh, the second one is how do, how do I get started um, and, in terms Andrew, of some advice? If I, my, if I may yeah. interrupt, just uh, as a follow-up, we have a question here from Rojendra. Oh, yeah. Uh, sure. So I would imagine, yes, I mean, that was a big challenge. And it was also the the times because you, you had to have those resources to teach those people in person. You had to have those physical seats to have the students come in physically. But now things are changing. So Rajendra is, is saying mm -hmm. that, well, now that online education is gaining, what stops from your universities, such as Simon Fraser mm -hmm. University, from offering courses to a wider audience and making it cheaper thereof? making their money from numbers, and also making education easily available worldwide. And it's something I was wondering as well from my university, University of British Columbia, where I'm working right now, really what's what's stopping them from really offering just more seats overall? Right. So from an economics perspective, I think there is little that would prevent this from happening. But 
there's a few things that major universities do that don't fit that model well. So one is academic research, the pursuit of knowledge in whatever discipline that happens to be, doesn't fit very well with the offer as many seats as you can kind of a setup. Um, so you have to figure out some ways of, of dealing with that creatively. I think the other one is that there are lots of providers that already offer relatively unlimited seats, you know, Coursera and edX and a number of other online providers of education and they fill a different niche than a traditional research university like say the university of british <coughs> columbia or university of toronto etc and so i think it's about trying to make an impact where you can provide the most value to your students and certain kinds of institutions have decided part of that is research and the pursuit of knowledge and the spillover effect from that into their classroom and so I think that's one of the reasons that they won't shift entirely to the massive open online course model. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, depending on the organization, may be contractual limits. So certain institutions, their contract with their faculty says you cannot have more than 30 or 40 or 50 or 70 people in a particular class. And so they have hard constraints based on contracts, which could change eventually. But that's that's the other reality that lots of them are up against right now is is well-meaning contracts to keep class sizes reasonable but those were all created in an era before online classes existed that's a great question though thank you and now sorry for the interruption again the uh, what no, was the follow-up okay. question diana no so that no i actually andrew um answered both of them Perfect. i do have another right no I think so. <laughs> so the, I do have some, another question about Plaid. Um, what are the, the main requests that clients come to you with? Hmm. We, we do get a wide variety of them that surround the idea of generally my data is a mess and how do I use it to be more effective at what I'm trying to do for my job or my overall goal for my department or that kind of question. So that's that's the really high level. I think in terms of the things that we're seeing the most of right now, it's, you know, how do I get my data from a source system like say Banner or PeopleSoft and into a more useful format for analytics and reporting so that my people can spend their time helping move the institution forward quickly rather than slinging together data and gluing it and taping it and hoping that it works out and a month later having data they really want it in in real time now and so we get a lot of we do a lot of work in that space and then the the more general now that i have some data and it's you know available daily or or even up to the minute i've never had to grapple with data that arrives that frequently how do i even think about this problem we spend a lot of time working through that with people as well Mm -hmm. And looking at looking at something that changes all the time is much different. It's closer to a fire hose, uh, trying to drink from a fire hose than it is drinking from, say, a, a glass of water. Yeah. Um, and so thinking through how you approach that and how you still keep up with the traditional things, like you have to report to the government on this day every year, um, doing both of those in parallel and becoming better at it as a consequence of having better technology, we help a lot in that space as well. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I gotta say the audience is really starting to warm up and they're asking quite a few questions. Now we only oh, have cool. a couple of minutes left, but I do want to pose this one here. And unfortunately her name is not showing up, but it's Krista Ward. So um, when you provide the insights on the data, how do you communicate it in a way that shows that the data can be used to make improvements across problems, especially in academia? There seems to be a disconnect in understanding the larger insights that the data can show. For example, the pandemic is unique, but we, those of us who teach in places like Texas, saw some of the same problems for our students this past week during the massive outages. Right, that's a really interesting question. And uh, for all those in Texas and the South of the US right now, I'm sending my well wishes and hoping it warms up and that the power comes back soon. It's been a, it's been a really hard week for week or so for a lot of people now. Um, so so that's first and foremost, we're, we're sending our best wishes from up north and hoping you're doing well. Um, in terms of communicating data insights like this, I find there's a few strategies that can help. So one is trying to make it relatable to people. So uh, on a scale that they can understand. So what I found when I worked with financial data in particular, and especially as you get into forecasting the future involving growth in say numbers of students and the price that they pay to attend, 
it becomes really hard for people to understand that really quickly because we're talking about either exponential or ge geometric growth and it's not something humans are particularly good at. We're good at linear, we, we get linear. Um, and so uh, relating it to people to say, you know, like what we're talking about here, if we talk about a 15% increase in re uh, tuition or the number of students, whichever, every year for three or four years, we're gonna double the number of people we have, right? Like imagine twice as many people on this virtual campus uh, as we had before, or imagine the same number of people we have now, but they're paying four times as much. That's mm -hmm. how the numbers get bigger in a hurry. So, so one way is trying to explain it the way that people can relate to today. You also see this with examples like, oh, that would be enough students to fill uh, three football, football fields. Stadium. Yeah, exactly. So you see analogies like that as well to help people relate to this information in a way that's more meaningful to them. So I think those are some of the good strategies. The other one that I think we need to continue to work on is uh, like the experience in this question sounds like somebody who's teaching a course. And I think the ability for the information from the people teaching courses to bubble up to the people making major directional decisions is still, still needs some work. Right, there, there are some communication channels, but I think everybody would acknowledge that two-way communication there, there's some challenges. And so being able to better move that information between the people teaching the classes and the people making major decisions in real time, I think is an area that communications professionals and IT professionals and a number of others can work together on to make it better, but that we're not there yet. I think there's a lot of work to be done to get that communication going. It's a really interesting question. Thank you. And we're, we're a little bit over our time, but I do want to remind everybody to please check out the website, which you can see right here. Just go to plaid.is and definitely check out the, the upcoming webinar on the rise of the logical data fabric in institutional research. Uh, it's a workshop, sorry, webinar slash workshop. So it's going to be interactive, <laughs> right, Andrew? It's going to be interactive, hands-on. You'll be, you'll be able to play with the tool and see how it goes for you. We're, we're really excited for this one. So we hope you can join us. And thank you, everybody, for the wonderful questions and for spending your Friday morning or evening uh, with us. It's appreciated. Thank you very much for coming to the show. Everyone connect with Andrew via LinkedIn. Thank you very, very much for being here and for being engaged. We love you very much. And we'll see you next week. Happy weekend. Bye, everybody. Have a great weekend, everybody.